Welcome in everybody to the Bare Knuckle Recovery Podcast, episode number seven. I'm Tommy Streeter, along with Nate Mollering, first podcast of the new year, 2023. Um, So originally the plan was to talk about, you know, going into the new year um, and kind of setting new goals, not necessarily resolutions. I don't a, a lot of people don't like that word, but it is something that we think is important. Yeah, um, something, like that, something that Nate and I have talked about every New Year's for the last, I don't know, three or four years now. Yeah. Um, but we may push that to the next podcast because this morning, Nate brought an article to my attention mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. he thought it would be important for us to talk about. So... This is an article from the San Diego Union Tribune out of San Diego, California, obviously. Not Uh, San Diego, uh, Indiana. to be Not San Diego, Indiana. I love to vacation there, but anyways, um, Nate, what what was the article about? Remind me. Well, so the article kind of just highlights where we're at with the opioid epidemic. We're talking about a new year. Um, You know, wrapping up 2022, we saw a decrease in non-fatal overdoses, at least here in Northeast Indiana. Um, and there's a wide variety of reasons that contributed that we'll get into all that, but this kind of highlighted some of the problems associated uh, with the opioid epidemic that we're still facing that really need to be addressed. Um, so as Tommy said, it's from the San Diego Union Tribune. Uh, and it's, it says it's a commentary by a doctor, an ER doctor who sees a lot of people come in the hospital, Dr. Natalie Laub. Yes. And so uh, Natalie Laub says, as a doctor, I regularly see young children test positive for fentanyl in San Diego County. And then it also says, while some children who ingest fentanyl are brought in via ambulance on life support, the most shocking part of the data is that many children have no symptoms of opioid ingestion, but they're still testing positive for fentanyl, which is very alarming. Um, You know, Tommy and I have spent a lot of time around fentanyl as uh, users. And um, now people in recovery who work with others who struggle with substance use disorder where their main drug of choice is fentanyl, um, which most people's drug of choice isn't fentanyl, really, it's opioids, but fentanyl is the most prevalent opioid on the street. Yeah. Um, even when people think they're buying other drugs, nine times out of 10, it's fentanyl. Yeah, we've talked about that before, but since you brought it up a little bit, I don't know the last time we saw somebody come in and fail a drug test for heroin, no. right? There's very little heroin on the streets anymore. Yeah, I mean, I could pull up the drug stats at some point uh, here. And um, for Allen County in 2022, if I remember correct, there was 12 grams of heroin seized by Fort and Vice Narcotics um, in in Allen County. And 12 grams, that's hardly any. Uh, like 12. Like Compared I, to what it would have been five or six years ago. Well, there's basically 12 doses per gram. So you're looking at 120 doses of heroin, essentially. And compared that's to nothing. the amount of fentanyl that they've recovered, <laughs> yeah. that's, yeah, that's nothing. That's for the entire county for the entire year, not just like one bust. I mean, yeah. that's, I mean, ba- I mean, we, I'll take, but when I pull it up at a later point, like we'll take a look at the numbers, but yeah. it, that's, that's, and, and that same spirit, you know, you look at um, the amount of fake press perk 30 fentanyl pills they seized 95,000 last year. I mean, that's insane. Yep. I mean, there's 380,000 people in Allen County. I mean, 95,000 fentanyl pills. And they estimate that 40% of them have the ability to be lethal. Four out of every 10. I mean, that's a lot of people. <laughs> well, and when you say the fake pressed pills, mm-hmm. so you've got the blue M30s, which are probably the most prevalent. There's yeah. white ones, there's green ones, but there the are. blue ones are the ones we see the majority of. There's the fake Xanax pills fake xanax bars whatever they are um and then other random pills that somewhat mimic you know like vicodin or orcos or anything like that Mm -hmm. but almost all of the pills that they confiscate from the streets these days have fentanyl and that's not just in allen county no that's across the country right and we've had an up close and personal look at those over the years you know when we were using those it wasn't a thing it was counterfeit pills yeah um you know i've been sober about five years tommy four somewhere in there um it was it was powder even though there was fentanyl it was powder fentanyl there yeah. wasn't fake press pills and the problem with the fake press pills which takes us back to the article is a lot of them look like they could be candy to a child right yeah. i mean a lot of them they're little blue pills i mean they're the size of um like little basically sweet candies yeah. that a lot of children you know even maybe it look like a child vitamin or something like that yeah. so a lot of the children in this article that they're talking about are the children aged one to five and a lot of so that was where 
so this doctor, um, Natalie Lau, worked with two other doctors, and they did a study, basically, um, children ages one to five, and I, I don't remember, I think it was from 2018 to 2022, where they focused on their study and how many kids came in and tested positive for fentanyl, but like from 2018 to 2022. Yeah. And they had, when in 2018 to 2022, they had a 1600 percent increase in the number of children under five years old that tested positive for fentanyl in that hospital, that one hospital in uh, San Diego. I don't remember what the name of the hospital was. It's in that article somewhere. Um, and we can ready children's hospital yeah, and we can post. We'll post a link to this on our page after we finish recording today. Absolutely. So you guys can see it before this comes out. But, you know, a lot of times if a child were to ingest a whole one of those pills, they're likely going to overdose. You would think. Yeah. But they were seeing a lot of kids come in that weren't overdosed, but they were mm -hmm. still failing their urine drug tests for fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And that's what was so alarming to the doctor was that right. these kids were coming in there and they were running around playing and like they right. were OK. Yeah. So that kind of causes you to start thinking these kids are kind of building up a tolerance they are to it because what happens is you know if say you live in a little one bedroom apartment for mm -hmm, example mm -hmm. and you've got kids in there and you're crushing up pills in your bedroom and snorting them and you're crushing up pills in the kitchen and snorting them or in the living room and snorting right. them wherever you're at mm -hmm. there's going to be little bits of powder that are left behind unless right. you're wiping down the surface every single time you do that and let's be honest most drug users are not doing that no so the kids are running around the apartment playing. You know how kids are. They touch everything and put everything in their mouths. Right. And so it's little bits, little tiny bits of fentanyl that are getting into their system at a time, which certainly can still be deadly. Yes. But they kind of compared it to dumping glitter mm -hmm. around an apartment in yeah. random spots around an apartment. You put some glitter in three different areas in a little apartment and you let a kid run around in there. That, get kid, into it. that kid is going to be covered in glitter when they come out of there. <laughs> right. And so they're kind of seeing the same thing or they're assuming that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's how these kids are getting fentanyl in their system. Yeah, I mean, it is. And, and like you said, they're building up a tolerance early on. Now, do we know for sure if they're building a physical dependency or not? The article doesn't say. Yeah, It leaves a lot open to speculation. Um also, it just shows that there needs to be further studies done with yep. these children. Uh, one of the big concerning things for me, you know, a lot of these kids, it's potentially setting them up for a life full of struggles Absolutely. with addiction because we don't know. We don't know if the first we don't know if that if that that positive test they had was the first time they were exposed. If it was the fifth, it was the sixth, it was the tenth, it was the hundredth. You don't know if that child's baseline is having fentanyl in their system and yeah. if they don't have it are they going to go through withdrawals and how can you tell if they were even impaired initially when they were introduced to it yeah. you know i mean if you have a child in a home where they've been around substance use like this for five years and they're five years old it could have been since day one that they yeah. have been had fentanyl in their system consistently so we know that ingesting large amounts of opiates and even not large amounts i mean we see that looking back on a lot of the data with young people who, you know, like sprained their ankle or had their wisdom teeth pulled, their brains are not fully developed. So it's not meant to handle hydrocodone or, or Dilaudid, yeah. <laughs> you know, or whatever it is. Um, an adolescent child who's under the age of five being exposed to fentanyl, their brain chemistry is undoubtedly thrown into chaos. Um, and, and to say that it could possibly have a developmental impact on them socially emotionally relationally physically is an understatement uh it could set them up for a life full of struggles and we're not going to see the full impact of the opioid crisis i think for at least another decade or more um you know with a lot of these kids growing up in these homes you know uh, also it begs the question you know what kind of condition are their parents and you know not only <clears> are they being exposed to fentanyl yeah. but what other things are they being exposed to we know from research that you start forming um your, your response to trauma you, you, before you can even form memories so seeing your parent in that state we've seen a lot of people on fentanyl a lot of people will tell you that oh my kids don't know well that's number that's a lie they can tell that there's something wrong with you many times because you'll nod out especially at the age of five right 
the kids aren't dumb. They're yeah. actually pretty smart. I mean, I think of my sponges. niece. She's four. Right. If my brother was sitting on the couch nodding out, she's yeah. absolutely going to know that something is terribly wrong. Or snorting powder off the coffee table through a dollar bill. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, a lot of times is, is kids witness that stuff and parents don't think it impacts them, but it certainly does. So you wonder about the physical, mental, emotional from the exposure to the substance, but also like, what are they being exposed to in the home as far as behaviors? Um, you know, a lot of people in the, uh, you know, like the, the community, as far as like social welfare, uh, like social workers, like I sit in a lot of these meetings with, um, people in these, um, overdose fatality review and, yeah. and, and people say things like, well, the data shows that actually removing a child from the home is more detrimental to the child than leaving it in a home with a parent that uses, that uses drugs. Yeah. I call bull crap on that, That's especially with debatable. this study. Well, especially when you throw fentanyl in the mix. Yeah. Because in the Allen County area, we have had multiple cases where children have gotten their hands on these counterfeit pills that look like candy, ingested yeah. them, and died. Yep. Um, and the parents aren't necessarily bad people, but one thing we see over and over again with these cases of exposure where there's a medical emergency the parents themselves who are impaired in, in, in the midst of addiction, they are not really um, in a mental uh, or emotional space to deal with the crisis in a reasonable manner when that child is turning blue, when they're experiencing yeah. an overdose. The, there was one case where the parent threw them in the bathtub and, and tried to turn on cold water instead of calling the yep. police because they were afraid. I remember that. Yeah. That was um, last year. So one of the things I think that goes, you know, um, unnoticed or, or it doesn't get enough attention is the impact that it's having on these children you know so one of the another part of this study it says we decided to look more closely at a group of children identified as drug endangered children who yes. had no symptoms of opioid ingestion but did fail initially fail to drug yeah. test for it it said <clears throat> this was a group of 40 children in san diego county known mm -hmm. to be in the presence of adults using fentanyl or near another child in a home right uh who did test positive for fentanyl 73 percent of those 40 children tested positive yeah so that's again that's just kids that live in a home where there are adults using fentanyl mm -hmm. almost three out of four tested positive for fentanyl that's crazy I mean, that's just, again, it highlights the problem. Um, and this obviously is not just happening in mm -hmm. San Diego County. This is just where yeah. the study was done. This is happening in Allen County. It's happening in Kosciuszko County, Whitley County, you all across. It. Yeah, everywhere. It's Yeah, it's it spans, you know, all of the United States. I think that's something that a lot of people probably overlook. It 100% is. Um, you know, and, and the thing that this, this kind of leads us into is um, how do you best deal with these, these things, uh, you know, how do you respond to issues like this that are um, very upsetting? It's, it's jarring to hear these things. Um, there, there's multiple approaches that are being um, presented by different sides on the opioid epidemic to try to get a handle on it, especially specifically fentanyl. Um, it has really drawn a lot of attention as it should, you know, yeah. uh, a lot of, we set records mm -hmm. last year, we set records in 2019, 2020, and 2021 for overdose deaths. 2022, the margin of um, are we going to be over or are we going to be under? Are we going to plateau is razor thin right now? There's a lot of coroner's reports that are still out that haven't come in yet. Um, it remains to be seen. Either we're going to be under, we're going to be over, or we're going to be right at the same number. Uh, either way, it's, it's still going in the wrong direction yep. as far as I'm concerned. You know, whether it's in 2021 in Allen County, there was 172 deaths, you know, right now I think we're at 36 with 50 something still pending toxicology. So if those come back and they're suspected overdoses, then we're probably going to be yeah. over the number of 170, which we're under, we're probably under 200, which is where we thought we were going to be. So that's positive. But you know, where do we go from here? So you, that was for fatal, right? That's for fatal. You know, so, I can I pull mean, up the stats, but and you mentioned that, you know, at the beginning of this show that the fatals, the non-fatal overdoses yep um were increased but the fatals were non-fatals were down too okay so so yeah non-fatals were down and that's right part of the reason for that is narcan narcan distribution so go ahead and talk about that while i pull up these numbers well you know like you just said there's kind of opinions on both sides of it for some reason there's still people that have a problem with 
Narcan distribution, which mm-hmm. just kind of blows my mind because right. the numbers are proving not just in Allen County, but again, a, a lot of counties in Indiana, believe it or not, I was at a conference uh, last year and Indiana was actually one of the leading states in the country when it came to Narcan distribution. And I think we're seeing the benefits of that now. Right. Um, you know, we it, are. it definitely is saving lives. Um, don't get me wrong. If somebody overdoses on fentanyl or any other opioid and you administer Narcan, you should still absolutely call 911. A lot of people aren't doing that now. Um, but basically, I guess it, if there is anyone listening who doesn't know what Narcan is, it's naloxone. And basically what it does is if you're overdosing on fentanyl or heroin or any other opioid like that, mm-hmm. um, it's a little nasal spray or there's a intramuscular injection that they have as well. But it's a little nasal spray. Um, and basically it rips all of the opioids out of the opioid receptor in your brain and makes you start breathing again yeah yeah yeah, so i've got the numbers here you know um so for 2021 we were at 173 fatals 2022 we're currently at 136 but we're at 136 with 38 pending toxicology you do the math yeah so if those come back we'll be 174 yeah one over one over which is exactly what happened between 2019 and 2020 one over one over we had 144 2019 145 in 2020 so there was a big jump when you compare that to the amount of fentanyl that was seized in allen county there's a lot more here every year there's more and more yeah. in allen county and every yeah. other county again for that matter um so there's more and more here there's more people using it so to think that it's only one above not to say that that's good right i'm surprised that it's not more though yeah i mean then we look at non fatal so i mean you know in 2020 um we set a record with 12 1243 non fatal overdoses last year we saw a drop a minor drop 1,227 non-fatals. 2022, we had 959 non-fatals. So that's down. Okay, it is. Um, and it begs the question, is it down because of Narcan distribution? I think yes. Or is it because there's fewer people using? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. We don't have the data to say that or support that. But we do know for a fact, like you said, Indiana is one of the top in the country for Narcan distribution. And I know there's a ton of organizations, uh, bare yes, knuckle, tons you know, of reco- um, like yeah. recovery community organizations, RCOs. I mean, project me, the mom of an addict thrive down yep. in Southern Indiana. There's yep. tons of them uh, yeah. that are distributing Narcan. Um, we, and it's and saving people, lives. I want people to know this too. In Indiana, there's a standing order from our surgeon general of Indiana. Um, I don't know if that's the correct term, but, um, for a prescription for Narcan for every resident in Indiana. You do not need a prescription. There's already a standing order that if you're a resident in Indiana, you can go to the pharmacy and buy Narcan. Now, that's only if you can't get some for free. Uh, There's, like I said, Overdose Lifeline is a great one. Ship Happens is a great one. Project Me is a distributor. Like Tommy said, Mom of an Addict. Bare Knuckle, contact us. We'll get you some Narcan. Uh, but if, it, if you're if you're in a pinch, you can go to the pharmacy. You do not need a prescription to buy Narcan. So that's one of the reasons why Indiana is the one of the leading. That is yep. not the case everywhere. Nope. And people don't not. know that. People take that for granted. Like they have done a good job of of putting Narcan at the <clears throat> forefront of this of this crisis and saying this is something we need to distribute widely. Um, so, the, you know, overall, I think that there is a positive shift happening. And. You know, that leads me to what we were kind of hit, talking about a little bit was the approaches to continue to curb the opiate epidemic going forward and the drug and mental health crisis in general. It's all tied together. You know, speaking of the mental health crisis, you know, I've got the suicide numbers here. 2020, there were 44 suicides. 2021, there were 67. So that's a big jump. Yeah. And then this year, we're down to 51. So we went back the other way. We still haven't returned to pre-2021 numbers, which is understandable, especially with, um, you know, there's still a lot of fallout from 2020. Oh, you yeah. know, there's a lot of upheaval, a lot of things to be concerned about, a lot of people with high anxiety. So that's 110% understandable. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because I think suicides and overdoses and drug use and all that stuff is, is strongly tied together. Yep. It's kind of like a chicken or the egg conversation, right? Yeah. Which one came first, mental <laughs> illness or drug use yeah. that caused mental illness? Right. It's hard to say. Most people struggle with both. Yep. Um, not a, not everyone, but a lot of people. So, you know, the one approach that I think has been widely effective in kind of getting down these non-fatals, and people say, why would Narcan distribution, what do you mean when you say Narcan distribution um, is getting the non-fatal numbers down? So, 
there are still people overdosing, but they're not calling 911, right? It's not being reported. So we don't have that data to collect, which, you know, like Tommy said, you should always call 911 and get the person checked out medically. But we understand why there are people who are hesitant. Yeah. They don't want to go to jail. Yeah. They don't want anybody else to go to jail, right? Like they're afraid of criminal justice, intervention, um, arrests being made, things like that. So that's why people don't call. But at the, but we know that people weren't calling before and that's also why people are dying. So yeah. we'd rather have them have Narcan and not call than, uh, you know, not, not call have Narcan and, not have and still not call. <laughs> right, 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 right. So um, the Narcan distribution is on the side of harm reduction, um, alternative programs, right? Like it's more the treatment uh, side of things, which yep. is vitally important. You know, one thing we've seen in the state of Indiana too, there's been an explosion of treatment options, right? There has. Which is, which is great. Yep. Um, more options for people, whether it be inpatient, whether it be outpatient, whether it's an MAT clinic, um, you know, different things for different people work well not everyone has a one size fits all program that is going to work super well. So there is more money flowing into those kinds of services. You know, you have things like the hope and recovery team, which kind of combines the two, you know, you've got the criminal justice side, you know, cause there's a lot of people that believe we need to create more laws to be harder on fentanyl traffickers, fentanyl dealers, things like that, the gangs that are pushing the stuff. And then there's yep. people that are like, well, we need to relax the laws uh, when it comes to people that are like possession uh, yeah. that that should get treatment, right? Yeah. The hope and recovery team kind of combines the two. It's two non-uniform detectives and two social workers that go out and follow up on overdoses, and they don't arrest people for warrants. You know, they don't press people for their sources. They're simply focused on getting people help. And that has made, I think, in Allen County a huge impact. I would like to say that they could take credit for some of the drop in numbers as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, along with all the other supporting I mean, we've, agencies. We've gone out with them and helped Many times. distribute Narcan. You know, we go to the hotels around yeah. Allen County and just go, you know, they follow up. Um, if somebody overdoses, you know, today, tomorrow, they go follow up with right. them, make sure that they have Narcan, um, offer them resources if they do want help. Mm -hmm. So this is a program that we have worked closely with and we definitely believe in. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, we wouldn't be on here advertising them if right. we didn't believe in what they do. Yeah. So it's a great program. Right. And that's like part of the intervention approach, right? So you've got yep. the prevention, you've got intervention, then you've got law enforcement. And those are like the three categories really that people are pushing. So the intervention, you know, going out, uh, distributing Narcan, like Project Me goes out and they distribute uh, safe use kits. Yep. So that is done in, in, in an effort to keep people from contracting diseases. Yep. One thing that we know is that the more obstacles people have to overcome when they get sober, things like hepatitis C or HIV, the less likely they are to have sustained long-term recovery. Yep. Uh, some people view that as enabling. Um, I don't necessarily view it as enabling. You're not giving them money to go get high. You're not giving them um, the drugs themselves. You're simply providing them with clean tools. It's almost like giving somebody clean eating utensils in a way, you know? Like, well, the people who have a problem with harm reduction are the people who would also say, well, they're drug addicts. You should just let them die. Right. That's and, their solution to the problem. So, and, you know, like I, um, I'm not going to say I understand where they're coming from, but I, I get how people I can get. I get the get, frustration. Yeah, the frustration. And, you know, like when, so we're on here talking about Narcan. Mm -hmm. There's going to be people that comment on this and talk about how, um, free Narcan is BS when right. you know so and so has to pay for their insulin. Right, I get it, mm -hmm. I understand, but also you need to understand all the Narcan that gets distributed, it gets paid for. There's grants that pay right. for it. There's Not organizations, nonprofit organizations that pay for it, mm -hmm. and then they distribute it for free. So mm -hmm. it is being paid for, but yeah, I mean, again, I understand where people are coming from i do too i mean i would encourage people if you want to get you know free insulin distributed to people then start a nonprofit and work on it i'm sure there's grants out there that you could apply for i'm sure um, there are. There's, there's grants out there for everything there are so. I, and there's no shortage of money out there that people are willing to give for good causes yep. yeah, i'm not saying it's going to be easy but oh the, it's not going to be easy but neither is starting a nonprofit and getting those grants so it's not you know and and the thing is like it's not a competition to see which people with which disease get the most help you know yeah, like not at all it's I, I, I saw this uh thing a while ago and it was talking specifically about how narcan is free but insulin mm -hmm. is not and basically it said other people who are struggling are not your enemy right it's true and that really is how it should be looked at right and so that goes along the lines with the inter with the intervention approach, you know. Um, a lot of people too, like we have the J the the JCAP program now in Allen County. 
jail chemical addictions program. They have one yep. in Kosciuszko County. They have one in St. Joe County. Yep. And that is people are still incarcerated, but they're incarcerated and they're going through a curriculum. Yep. It is, it is a reentry program essentially, which teaches them how to live life sober, yep. right? It teaches them skills, things that they may never have picked up otherwise. And that's super important because some of those people, that's the only chance they may ever have it at going to treatment center. Right. I mean, yeah. well, and I know a lot of people, especially in Kosciuszko County, because that's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I work, worked pretty closely with uh, um, Courtney Jenkins who facilitated JCAP for the last few years. And she would allow me to come in there and, you know, sit down and talk with the guys mm -hmm. and then go to the graduations for all of them. Right. And the amount of people that, you know, I went to school with people that I used to get high with that went through that program and had nothing but great things to say about it and are still doing well. It's mm -hmm. been awesome to see that in yeah. Kosciuszko County. And then, you know, you have that. So those are the people that are incarcerated. But then, you know, post-incarceration, you have things like drug courts, um, treatment programs where people can go to, you know, like there's a big uh, movement out there to divert funding um, more towards, um, well, I mean, for lack of a better, diversion programs, right? Where yep. you would, instead of going to jail, you would go to a treatment center or to some other kind of skill building yep. um, program. And so... That is something that is really, you know, important uh, and it is making a big impact. However, you know, Tommy and I are big per believers in there are still consequences to our actions. So if you get caught robbing a grocery store to pay for your addiction, yes, you're someone who has an addiction. It's a disease. You didn't choose to have a disease of addiction. However, we still have to be held accountable for robbing a grocery store. Yep. And that doesn't mean there's a lot of people that would say, well, addicts should never go to jail. You know, they're sick. I agree that they're sick, but you still have to pay, you know, you still have to do the time sometimes. And that's not bad. Like sometimes it's good no, to go. Sit. I know lots of people that got sober in jail. That's what I was going to say. How many people have told, I mean, Alicia is one of them. Alicia, Alicia said Wells. If, if she hadn't have gone to prison, she wouldn't be sober today. Exactly. There's a lot of people that feel that way that if yeah. they didn't get arrested for doing whatever they were doing to pay for their drugs, mm -hmm they wouldn't have been able, they wouldn't have gotten sober in the first yeah. place. So, so, I mean, there, I love diversion programs, but you know, like everything, whether it's prevention, intervention or justice, I mean, it has its limitations and there are still, um, there's still consequences to our actions, you know, and jail is not the end of the world for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, it, it can be good for you. I mean, I'm it's all not about, it's not going to be fun, but <laughs> no, I mean, but it'll be it's all not right. fun, yeah. but if that's what it takes to get you started on your path to recovery, then so be it. So be it. You know, um, I'm not somebody that believes nobody should ever go to jail. Like jail's there for a reason. And sometimes we have to pay for our crimes. Um, and then you've got the people that are prevention who really want to lean into stopping people before they get started. That's tough. Prevention is. is tough. Prevention stuff, but all of this stuff, intervention stuff too, you know, um, sure. there's a lot of evidence to suggest if you can stop them before they get started, like they're, you've got a great chance of it being successful. Um, it's not always simple though. Yeah. How do you keep people from developing these disorders where they feel the need to self-medicate? Uh, a lot of it's societal, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, we talk, well, especially these days when yeah. so many people start so young, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, we were just talking about children one to five, but right. let's talk about children 12 to 16. Right. That's when most people i guess maybe not most but a lot of people start using drugs around yeah. those ages you know end of middle school beginning of high school throughout high school right and you know once again we work with a lot of kids that are we in do. high school and middle school we do um i'm currently uh part of the um board in uh Kosciuszko county where we just got a grant to address prevention and adolescence and we're talking like elementary school middle school mm -hmm, aged kids mm -hmm. high school as well but it's tough man because you just you can't scare kids you know you we went through the dare program and we were told drugs are bad don't mm -hmm. do drugs that mm -hmm. didn't work obviously right. they kind of revamped the dare program mm -hmm. again one of the things that i do in Costco county is work with the dare officers and it's really more about making good choices now than it, it is, is going in there and telling them that drugs are bad and you know waving your finger at them well, and telling them not to do drugs and i think that's important is mm -hmm. educating them basically Educated, that's right that's so that's what prevention is prevention is education yeah that's really all 
we can do is right. you know give them this information so that when they're presented with the opportunity to use drugs or alcohol mm-hmm. they can then make an informed decision and give them alternative tools for dealing with um emotional and mental distress yeah, make sure that they know that it's okay to talk about what's going on up here what's going on in here yeah. what's going on at home like right. it's okay to talk about that stuff you know for a long time a lot of especially young men were mm-hmm. told don't talk about that stuff like, right um obviously we see the problems that that caused yeah and we kind of dealt with that you know i guess not kind of we did deal with that yeah. when we were younger right so that's i think the main thing that i try to focus on and you know as well as with remedy live when we go do the get school tour we yep. that's one of the things that we try to you know beat into these kids yeah. is that it's okay to talk about this stuff you're 100%. not the only one that feels the way that you feel no you're not not at all um yeah i mean it's it's one of those things where you want to give them the tools that they need so they can make different choices, yeah. you know, and really it's about empowerment, empowering people uh, on the front end so they can have the, that opportunity to develop healthy coping mechanisms and not ultimately um, self-medicate, yeah. which is what addiction ultimately is, right? Self-medicating um, continuously. So, I mean, those are two very important parts of the puzzle. And that's the thing is like a lot of people lean heavy one way. They're like, oh, we got to do prevention. We got to do intervention. Um, And I know that there's, you know, there's not a huge appetite for a lot of people talk about the failure of the drug war. And to a certain extent, they're partly correct. Yeah. The drug war has failed. It's criminalized drug use um, to a certain extent. But I think luckily we're moving away from that. Even with the law enforcement perspective, a lot of them do not want to lock up the people who are using. But however, I will say, okay, let me say this because a lot of people talk about, um, you know, you shouldn't go to jail for possession. You shouldn't go to jail for possessing a syringe. There is an argument to be had for that. I can also show you a lot of people who ended up on a drug court or in jail because they got arrested for a syringe or because they got arrested for having a fake perk 30 or a bag of heroin and they're alive today because of it. And they will tell you that, that if they hadn't got arrested and they hadn't been made, because a lot of people like, Oh, you have to want to recover. No, you do not. Nope. You just have to do it. Recovery is not people who want it or need it. It's people that do it. And sometimes the justice system pushing you to do it is a good thing. So, I, I'm torn on, you know, like, do you do you want to decriminalize um, small amounts? I know people refer to per- Portugal all the time. They tried it out in, um, I think it's Washington, yeah, Oregon, Oregon. Doing that. It was a, it was a horrible failure. It's a horrible failure. It, it, it's it's become it's just awful. Look into it. All you have to do is look it up. It's 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 just a massive failure. They're not Portugal. Okay, Portugal is a very different country. It's very different people, different population, different demographic than the yeah. United States. Um, so this idea that we're just going to decriminalize our way out of it, like drugs should be legal, like you should decriminalize use, decriminalize all the, all the paraphernalia. Um, I don't know if that's really the path forward. I'm certainly willing to hear people out on it. And it's, but here's the thing. It's not a black and white answer. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, but on the law enforcement side of things, saying the drug war has been a failure entirely is not necessarily true. There were positive things that came out of the drug war. You cannot simply just walk away from these distributors and from these criminal organizations that are killing people and let them off scot-free. Yeah. We have to have some kind of enforcement. There has to be some kind of hammer to come down on the right people. These are not good people. I always I always compare it to everybody knows, everybody in America agrees that ISIS is the bad guys, right? Like they're cutting people's heads off. And their motivation was what? Their motivation was uh, a distorted, perverted version of Islam, right? They believe that God was telling them to do this. They had to wage jihad. It's the only way to get to heaven, their higher power, right? The cartels, the the Chinese trans criminal organization, and and the local uh, collaborators in the United States are basically ISIS. Their higher power is just greed. It's money. Yep. Not only are they involved in drug trafficking, they're involved in the fastest growing black market illegal trade in the world, human trafficking, trafficking. which literally translates to human trafficking is a nice way of saying it. Slavery is the accurate term for it. Human slavery. There's more slaves today than there are ever, ever have been. There's 30 million people that we know of in the, in the world who are enslaved currently. And a good portion of those are people coming into the United States. 
um, or people that are in the United States. So this idea that we're going to legalize everything and these in these drug cartels that are making trillions of dollars, these are multi-trillion dollar a year organizations. That's going to cause that would cause so many more problems. <laughs> They're not going away. They're not going away. There has to be a criminal justice side of things. And the, recently, there's been legislation introduced to schedule xylazine, which is a drug that's being cut into fentanyl, which is just making I just saw that the overdose there. crisis worse. There's um, legislation being introduced to change the minimum sentencing of 10 years to what triggers it now is you have to have 400 grams of fentanyl 400 grams of fentanyl is a lot of fentanyl yeah now it's going to be i think what was the number was it five something like that maybe 10 i'd have to look i could pull it up but um much lower threshold and some people say oh my gosh well that's going to be people in jail who are users it might, but at the same time, like these mid-level drug dealers that are peddling death, and they know they're peddling death. Oh, yeah. They're you know. well aware that people are dying. You can't tell me these guys on Snapchat don't know that their customers are dying. They know. They know full well. Yep. And they don't care. These people have to be dealt with. And these people are not necessarily individuals that can always be 100% reformed. We want to reform everybody, and we should reform as many people as possible I'm simply trying to highlight that prevention, intervention, and law enforcement are three things, and they're three legs of the stool. Yeah, there's not one of them individually that's going to solve all of these problems. They all go hand in hand and are going to have to work together moving forward to make any positive difference in yeah. what, we're, what we're facing right I now. I definitely think there should be a shift in law enforcement as far as you know the approach to people that are struggling um some of the policing tactics but a lot of that's already happening yeah there uh, definitely has been happening yeah we've We've got body cameras you've got policy changes all over the place um police are carrying narcan they're getting people on the treatment um they're trying their best to do more community policing i mean hope and recovery team whether people realize it or not and the stuff that detective gerardo sergeant gerardo does uh, it's community policing 101 it's just they don't we don't call it that you know they don't even realize it sometimes but that's exactly what they're doing me out in the community talking to community members seeing how they can help them how they can serve them which is why they signed up in the first place um but this idea that you can have one without the other and it's just going to fix the problem and that's that i think is where we are seeing a big issue is um you've got all these different sides who are saying my solution is the solution and the other ones are epic failures. Yeah. It's not going to, it's not going to work. We need a cohesive group of people moving in the same direction is exactly what we need. So every one of those pieces needs to be thoroughly explored and we need to find best practices and come together and figure out ways to do it. You know, um, we, we look at the legalization of marijuana where everybody said over and over that legalizing marijuana was going to get rid of the black market. It was going to keep drugs out of the hands of kids because, you know, I had to go to a dispensary. You got to get a medical card. We have seen 100% the opposite occur. The black market is exploding. I saw a special the other day on uh, Oklahoma now legalized medical marijuana and the majority of the grow ops that they're raiding right now are illegal grow ops uh, owned by Chinese companies that are engaging in murder, extortion, human slavery. Um, it has actually empowered these criminal organizations because now they feel like they have carte blanche to do whatever they want. Yep. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't use medical marijuana as medicine. That's not what I'm saying at all. Don't misunderstand me. This idea that we're going to decriminalize everything and legalize everything and everything, all these, like, if there's no laws, there's no crime. Well, that's one way to look at it. But I think you're just going to see an explosion of victimization. That's of a terrible people. way to look at it. Well, but that's how that some people look at it. That statement in general is just ridiculous. I understand. But... <clears throat> And just my personal opinion. people are going to not like some of the things I had to say, but I'm trying to look at it from a balanced approach. You know, things are not usually on the right. They're not usually on the left. They're usually somewhere in the middle. Yeah. You know, like there's your story, there's my story, then there's the truth. So I think the most balanced approach we can take um, 
is really ultimately what's going to solve a lot of these problems, like these things with these children. Again, I don't think that these parents should be hauled in and arrested and, and treated like criminals. Like we need to find out what's going on and get them help. Yeah. However, if they do not accept the help, yeah, if they're not willing to get help, that's a different story. And that's where I draw the line. You yeah. know, everybody deserves a chance. Some people deserve second, third, fourth, fifth chances to a certain extent. Yeah. But at the same time, as we want to be as we want to be as understanding as possible we also have to protect our most vulnerable populations which is the kids the kids uh people who have uh developmental disabilities people who uh don't have the resources that other people do in order to achieve the same level of services and in in uh they don't have the same resources available that is the population we need to focus on protecting and many times those are the people that are victimized the most by these criminal organizations true we cannot um i don't know how to put it but we can't hug our way out of the opioid epidemic that is certainly part of it the opposite of addiction is human connection i am huge on that yeah i am huge on that but there is the same at the same time there's a lot of people that need to answer for what they've done and what they're going to continue to do so there's three legs to the stool you need all three for the stool to stand on its own um and if the stool falls everybody that's sitting on the stool is going to fall and topple and that's exactly what's happening right now yeah you know and people are right they want to say that the drug war that was us putting the stool on one leg yeah. <laughs> for a long time we do see that it is a complete failure to just throw everybody in jail. You cannot throw everybody in jail. It doesn't work. You know, we decided in the 1980s under Reagan to close down the mental hospitals and the institutions. And we did that because there was a rampant abuse of the people in those things. And that was correct in um, getting rid of the people who were abusing them, but closing them down. We're now seeing was potentially not the right way to go. Yeah, probably not. No. So what we need is a cohesive effort from everybody to come together. That's prevention, intervention, and justice. And look at this as a American problem that affects all of us. It's not a red or blue issue. It's a red, white, and blue issue. And it needs to be treated as such. The only way forward is unity. Again, the opposite of addiction is human connection. And the human connection is the only way out of this crisis. But everybody has a different part to play. And yeah. to think that everybody's going to get, you're know, going to jam a square peg into a round hole. And everybody has to subscribe to your way of doing it. It's just not true. Yeah. Play your role and let other people play theirs. I will say that, and you know, you've seen this too, but especially in our communities, there mm -hmm. are a lot of people that are getting on the same page. When there it comes are. To law enforcement, treatment providers, mm -hmm. recovery community organizations, politicians, like, the, I mean, there's a lot of people that are getting on the same 100%. page. Um, I mean, the prosecutor in Kosciuszko County, he comes to our K code meetings mm -hmm. every month, mm -hmm. which I think is awesome that he's there and he's invested yeah. in it and he cares and mm -hmm. he wants to help and not just throw everybody in jail. Right. There's a lot of law enforcement officers and first responders that come around. to that meeting as well. So there are a lot of people that are getting on mm -hmm. the same page and that really is awesome to see, but it's going to take more going forward. Well, we have to remove the stigma. Like there's a lot of social workers that hate the police. And there's a lot of police that hate social workers, <laughs> but when you sit them down at yeah. the same table and they talk about their goals they're the same goals they just have different visions different on how ways to, to accomplish yeah. yeah and that's all i'm trying to get at man like we don't have to be so divisive about this yep. people sit there and they scream and yell at each other and they're like well my way or the highway well then what happens to the people in the middle you know we all want the same thing we just maybe have different visions on how we get there but we're going to have to work together to get it done. That's yeah. Just, Having three people work on the same task from three different angles is not a bad thing. No, but they need to talk to each other Yeah, because absolutely they need to communicate. And yeah. Be on the same, you know, and that's but, all I'm trying to get yeah. at, you know, like we need a balanced approach and some people are, you know, not going to like the fact that I say that, but it's just the way I've never seen a problem get fixed with an unbalanced approach that yeah. doesn't create more problems in the end. And that's exactly how we got here. And I'm acknowledging that the justice system has been broken. The drug war, the way we ran it was terrible. Yep. Um, we need a different approach, but to think that we just need to throw out law enforcement altogether in the judicial yeah, system is 100% not the answer. So I'm 100% pro prevention 100 pro inter i'm pro intervention i'm pro justice i'm pro harm reduction i'm pro treatment but i'm also pro accountability like you can be for yeah, you all, can those be things. all of those it's things. not exclusive you don't have to just pick yeah. one um 
and that's what I want people to understand, you know, and I understand these are controversial things to talk about, but we got to talk about them. <laughs> that's why, hey, that's why we, <laughs> that's do, why we this, do this. We talk about stuff that a lot of other people don't want to talk about. That's, and that's why okay. bare knuckle recovery was yeah. started in the first place. And bare knuckle recovery was started and our heart is 100% involved. It is, is our heart is 100% into helping people. We don't want to push it one way or the other. Um, at the end of the day, like, financial benefit there is none to tommy or i whichever way we go honestly um because that's not really what's important to us yeah but a lot of people talk about success you know like and that has to do with a lot with which way people push the agenda um at the end of the day is, is people afraid they're not going to get funding or get get money um true success is the impact we have on our communities the people within our communities the families at an individual and at a family and then at a holistic level and like seeing healing our own and restoration also. yeah i mean that in my opinion is true success being an agent of change that has an impact on people around you in a positive way that's success yep. i know a lot of people with a lot of money in the treatment industry or, or whoever they're with in the law enforcement or justice that own private prisons or people that own treatment centers and they are miserable sobs yep and they're always going to be miserable SOBs because it's all about them. Yep. It's all about the dollar. It's not about the people they serve. And that is 110% where our heart's at with this stuff. So when people hear stuff that they don't agree with, don't just come out and attack us. Come have a conversation with us. I mean, like, if you really want to be on our show, come talk to us about it. And if you have some opposing viewpoints, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. We'll yeah. sit here and discuss opposing viewpoints all day. Yeah. Noah would love it. Noah does love that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So... All right, well, guys, I don't have anything else. You got anything else, Tommy? No, I don't think so. Um, I think this was definitely an important topic for us to cover. I'm glad you sent me that article this morning and gave me the opportunity to read it before coming on here today. Um, we will talk about, you know, setting goals and mm -hmm. things like that for, um, you know, going into the new year. Not our next podcast, because our next podcast, we're going to have Clinton on here mm -hmm. to talk yeah. about Remedy Live, yeah. which is where our studio is at. We're mm -hmm. going to talk about the Get School Tour. We're going to talk about Dopamine Nation, the mm -hmm. book that we use for, you know, what we base the Get School Tour off of. So the book Dopamine Nation, look into it. Read that book. It's amazing. It'll so change we'll, your life. <laughs> yes, it absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that's what we'll be covering next week when we come into the studio for the podcast we've got a few more scheduled we've got some more guests scheduled mm -hmm. uh for mm -hmm. this year so one one last thing i want to say you know if you're somebody that wants to get involved in the opiate epidemic as far as like an agent of change educate yourself read books read articles but again don't read the stuff that you want to read that just is interesting to you as far as your viewpoint read them all and come to your own conclusion get involved with your politicians whether it be a lot of people don't know you've got your city council uh, people you've got your your county commissioners you got your county council you got your sheriff you got your coroner uh and then you've you know you've got your your state reps and then you've got your state senators and then you've got your um federal reps and then you've got your federal and then you've got your senators from your state get to know those people and yeah, talk especially to them. those local people yeah. you can reach those local people a lot easier than you think they want to hear from you they want to hear from people in the community who care who want to get involved that's what we do that's where oh we get God. a lot of this information from yeah. we're not just pulling this stuff out, out, of, out of thin air no so. no so get involved educate yourself again don't just read the stuff that you agree with read the stuff you don't agree with tommy and i make we force ourselves to do that all the time um it you know keep an open mind that's what it's all about that's how we're going to fix this thing is having an open mind and and coming together honestly so get involved reach out to your politicians reach out to your local media um educate yourself reach out to people you care about get involved with some nonprofits. there's awesome nonprofits in allen county in kazasco county and adams county in dekalb county i mean all the counties around here so yep. get involved um because we need you we need you we need everybody and if there's anything we can do to help as always reach out to us yep. you guys know how to reach us on the website on our facebook page my phone number emails on there you can send us a message on facebook um instagram if that's your thing i mean we're on all of the platforms so as always if there's anything we can do to help if you guys have questions comments i'm sure yeah. we'll see plenty of comments on this one so sure that's fine looking love forward it. to that um so as always thank you guys for watching uh sharing liking the page we appreciate your support and we'll see you next time. Yep.